Once upon a time, fairy tales and stories begin like this, from Cinderella to the brothers Karamazov, and in a sense also, true tales in the news, stories with dramatic twists and sometimes happy ends. In this episode of the ETH podcast, we will tell you a story without a happy end. Февраля 59 группа туристов лужников перестала выходить на связь. Все участники были найдены мертвыми. One of the many epilogues to the story originates from two scientists in Switzerland. My name is Jennifer Kakshuri. I'm glad you're joining us. It all began a bit more than 60 years ago, in the winter of 1959, in a very remote, snowy region of Soviet Russia. A group of students and the recent graduates from Ural Polytechnic went on an expedition to Ural Mountain. They were supposed to be away for 12 days. And um, they didn't come back. This is Alexander Puzrin. He's a professor and the chair of geotechnical engineering at ETH. Originally, there were 10 of them. One of the group members had to return because of the pain he had in his leg. And nine others continued and they did not return on time. Relatives got worried. Some rescue expeditions were organized. And three and a half weeks after the incident, they were found. None of them was alive anymore. The tent was destroyed. There were no bodies near the tent. The closest body was 800 meters away. There were also bodies 1.5 kilometers away in the forest, downhill from the tent. The bodies were found in a very weird state. Uh, some of them were half naked. They had pretty nasty wounds. This was a mystery which has been haunting Russia for the past 60 years. The mysterious circumstances and the tragic death of the young hikers became a big story known as the Dyatlov Pass incident. Alexander was born and raised in Moscow, where his academic journey began. He has studied and taught at universities in several places, including Haifa, London, Oxford, Tokyo and Atlanta. He's at ETH since 2004. Did Alexander know about the Dyatlov incident back then as a child or young man in Moscow? We didn't know much about it when I grew up in Soviet Russia because the files were secret of the investigation. Criminal investigation lasted three months and it was closed because they did not find their uh, criminal intent. The conclusion was that it was a uh, compelling force of nature that killed them. But For some reason, after that, the files were made secret. Of course, after Soviet time, the case became better known. At a certain stage, even the files were open. And there was a page in Wikipedia, which one day I came across. And I was fascinated, of course. This was about 10 years ago. Meanwhile, Alexander Puzrin's name shows up on this exact Wikipedia page about the Dyatlov incident. From being fascinated by a story and all its legends, how did Alexander get involved? It was Joan Gaum who approached Alexander. I am professor at EPFL, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, and I am the head of the Snow and Avalanche Simulation Laboratory, which is called SLAB, and we are interested in particular in snow and avalanche mechanics. Joan spent much of his time on snow. He used to be a snowboard professional. I'm a big fan of the mountains. I'm a mountain practitioner. I do a lot of snowboarding. And it's really this passion of the mountains that caught me into this field of research. Well, my expertise lies in uh, geotechnical engineering and natural hazards. By natural hazards, I mean earthquakes, landslides, tsunamis. And in particular, I have been interested in the phenomena which is delayed in time, when you have a trigger, but the event itself takes place some time later, like a ticking time bomb. The mountains, snow and natural hazards link us to the Dyatlov incident. We'll hear more about it in a bit. First, a phone call from the U.S. 
brought the Dyatlov story to Joan's attention. It was in 2019 when the Prosecutor General of Russia reopened the case upon request of the families. And at that time, it created quite a big mediatic buzz. And the New York Times was writing an article about that. And they wanted to have my opinion about the uh, hypothesis of a slab avalanche to explain the case that was already the hypothesis of the prosecutor general. The slab avalanche hypothesis was discussed a lot because there weren't any traces of any kind which is unusual. And in addition, the slope of the student's tent didn't seem steep enough. And so when they called me, basically, I never heard about the death of case. So I asked them to call me back a few days later. I started to read a lot of documentation and I really got caught into it. And when they called me back, not only I told them that I really believe that a slab avalanche can be the plausible explanation for the case, but I also told them that I will not stop there. I want to go deeper into the case from a scientific point of view. That's actually when I contacted Alexander Puzrin from ETH to work together on this case. So a phone call and an email mark the beginning of the collaboration, or in a sense, part two of the Dyatlov story, at least for the geotechnical engineer Alexander and the avalanche expert Joan. How did they actually collaborate? We were working on different types of models. So he was working on the theoretical aspects and I was working on the numerical aspects to simulate the avalanche impact on the bodies. And, you know, we are both, I think, perfectionists. And so it took us quite a long time to end up with models that were satisfactory for both of us because we wanted to have not only a, a physically based model, but also something quite elegant. And so we were going back and forth, you know, questioning our own assumptions until we were both happy with what we had to propose. And uh, that's when we submitted our paper. Alexander and Joan wanted to solve the question of what caused the death of these young students. Since the accident a bit more than 60 years ago, there have been various attempts to explain it. Tales of Soviet military experiments, conspiracy theories and yetis, as well as extraterrestrials. But Alexander and Joan don't want to prove one or another story as false or true. They had something else in mind. I will be honest with you, not because of the mystery, because all of a sudden we realized that there is an interesting mechanical problem hiding behind this whole story. Because this avalanche is not a usual avalanche. And we were curious whether we can explain it using modern mechanical and mathematical tools. According to Alexander, and as Joan mentioned before, the idea wasn't new, but the methods are. But back to when the incident happened and the young people were found far from the tent. According to the scientists, the young people seem to have had a horrible night. Something forced them to leave the tent in the middle of the night with very strong winds and very low temperature of minus 24 degrees. And to survive without clothes was not possible. So the reason they are so far away is probably that they tried to escape. They went down to the forest where they could hide. What forced them to leave? The two scientists assume it was a small avalanche that all of a sudden slid into the tent. But what was special about this avalanche? Actually, four things. The first was that the slope, which collapsed where this uh, slab avalanche took place, was pretty mild. It was about 23 degrees on the surface. The rule of thumb says that avalanche takes place when your slope is steeper than 30 degrees. This is not entirely true, but nevertheless. Second, there were not obvious traces of the snow avalanche when rescuers came there. Of course, we have to say they were not looking for the traces of the snow avalanche, right? But there was not something that just popped up. One of the biggest mysteries is this delay. Okay, because the autopsy has established that the death took place in the morning or in early hours of the morning. So you can back calculate and realize that they left the tent during the night. And froze. And froze. But normally to cause an avalanche, all you need to do is to cut the slope. And that's what they did in order to put the tent in. So how come... It took 7 to 13 hours for the avalanche to take place. This delay is a big mystery. And finally, the injuries. 
These injuries were absolutely not typical for avalanche victims. Can you tell us the typical injuries for avalanche victims? The typical one is a lack of air, asphyxiation. That's how people die. And here, at least two victims had many ribs broken. One had the skull broken. And then, of course, there were even more mysterious injuries like missing eyes and a missing tongue. This, of course, by no way can relate to, to the avalanche. This probably happened later, wild animals. But uh, even with those ribs, this was also something that we had to consider. So these four main counter-arguments had to be investigated. The four points again. One, the slope is not steep enough for an avalanche. Two, there were no traces of an avalanche when the rescue team arrived. Three, the avalanche should have started immediately after cutting the slope to place the tent. And four, the injuries didn't look like they were caused by a regular avalanche. Alexander and Joan disproved all these points, published their results in a paper, and attracted attention. Of course, people are impressed by the equations and, uh, and all these things in the paper, but that's not what really the general public is looking in the paper. They are mostly looking at the assumptions that we are making. And uh, one assumption that we make is that the slope angle above the tent is steeper than the average slope angle here. And this is still hard to convince people about that. Even if we have data, even if we have pictures, it's really hard to convince people. And actually about that, I would like to mention that a colleague of us went to the Dyatlov Pass twice with a drone to finally close this debate about the slope angle and, and measure it based on drone photogrammetric images. And so we have the data now, we are currently processing it, and this will be part of a big documentary that will be out normally next year, and I'm really excited about it as well. And yes, also about the impact of a potential avalanche on the bodies. It was hard for people to think that such a small avalanche could lead to these injuries. Okay, I get it. A slab avalanche, a small one with great harm, but no traces of what is commonly understood by an avalanche. As a mountain practitioner, I know that a big and hard snow block can really lead to some strong injuries, but we had to prove it. So that's why we did these numerical simulations. And I think our paper convinced many, many people, but there is still a uh, part of the, of the population which really invested a lot in this case. Uh, they will never trust a natural cause for that. They want to believe in a technogenic cause, such as, I don't know, a nuclear test. You know, radioactivity was found on some of the people clause, but they, they are very simple explanations for the numerous weird things in the Dyatlov incident. That's why it became the Dyatlov mystery, is that when you look at individual piece of evidence, you realize that it's really mysterious when you put all these things together. But when you take them one by one, it's easy to find a simple explanation for all these things. Alexander is the one in charge for the delay in hazards. Joan for the simulation. He got inspired by Frozen, a Disney movie. Hello. When you look at the snow in the Disney movie Frozen, you're amazed by how realistic it looks. And that's because they use this particular method. And they use also, let's say, physically based method to make the snow look good in the movie. And so this inspired me. And I went to Los Angeles to collaborate with a mathematician who actually consulted in the Disney movie Frozen. But I want to mention that the model that we developed is not the model of Disney. It's a different one, which is based on critical state soil mechanics, which has been validated based on experiments. So, yes, there is an inspiration. I'm also a big Disney fan, and I like to acknowledge this inspiration. But the model is different from the model used by Disney, which is called Matterhorn, for the anecdote. With a film such as Frozen, the story would have been impossible to tell without compelling and believable looking snow. But how do you animate all that snow? Do you animate each snowflake individually over and over again until you've created convincing looking snowfall? Because there are so many, artists now harness the strength of the computer to create snow using real world physics. Computer algorithms take away the tedious work and allow artists to focus on the creative work. This is all known as simulation. Speaking about films, A Russian series came out last year called Dead Mountain, 
The Dyatlov Pass Incident. So far it only exists in Russian. And Alexander watched the series. I was really curious to see, you know, what did they take. Of course, it's a fiction. But there were few things that really surprised me. I am not actually a big fan of Russian produced series. HBO and Netflix are very difficult to beat. But this one was very special. I have to say this was probably one of the best series produced in Russia and this is not just my opinion. I think very reputable critics put it as number 1 in 2020. The part which actually describes that of expedition has been done very carefully. Even it's filmed in black and white, and they even managed to reproduce all the photos there. <laughs> so uh, some of the episodes, you really see people group themselves into the stills that we get. And uh, they very carefully went through all different hypotheses. And in the last episode, number eight, I mean, believe it or not, I watched this series and it's like reading our paper. Because quite surprisingly, without knowing anything about our paper, right, they reproduced pretty much the same scenario that we find the most feasible with the avalanche hypothesis, also the slab avalanche, crack forming and so on. So this was quite amazing. But what was very interesting for me that, okay, our avalanche is a trigger. It's very interesting what happened later. This we will never know. But what they show there is actually quite touching, okay? Because if indeed some of the people got injured by the avalanche in the tent and not later, then it really becomes a story of uh, the friendship and the courage because the remaining people could probably easily escape if they left their friends behind. But they tried to save them until the very last moment. There has been a lot of noise around Alexander and Joan after they published their paper. A Swiss documentary with the two of them is being edited and produced right now and should premiere next year. They both gave several interviews to magazines such as Nature, National Geographic and also tabloid newspapers. And they are also superheroes in a graphic novel. So I ask Alexander, where does he go from here with his story? I go back to my boring stuff, <laughs> which I actually uh, myself find probably more important for humanity, but it will never get that much attention. I'm probably, you know, too rational in order to spend the rest of my life on the Dyatlov mystery. But this doesn't mean if some interesting additional data surfaces one day, where I can use my skills to resolve some issues, I will be happy to go back to it. Thank you for joining the ETH podcast, Alexander Puzrin from ETH Zurich and Joan Gom from EPFL. My name is Jennifer Kakshuri. This podcast is produced by the Audiobande, the joint venture for sound adventures. <laughs>